So I'm going to start uh, rec recording. Yeah, thanks, thanks for Chris for joining us. You're actually what we would call the front run of a uh, front man of PEP PT, the standard. And uh, we had uh, a session so uh, yesterday talking about in, in a panel setting, actually talking about the, the different solutions out there in the market. We missed you, of course. Uh, you have been busy yesterday. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing on a daily basis besides developing PEP PT? So uh, actually, I watched the session. It was very interesting, the discussion you had. Um, I was really sad that, that I wasn't uh, uh, there. I would, have, I would have actually liked to ask a few questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if I'm not doing crazy stuff like this, uh, I actually run an AI company, which is focused on automating enterprise processes. Interesting. So um, for, for us today and for our talk here, so maybe it's a, a, approximately one hour or so, uh, we will focus more on the technical side and the development side of uh, what we call the contact tracing app. So uh, as I mentioned, you, uh, you're actually behind the standard, which is called PP, PPET, PT, which sounds just crazy, uh, which means Pan-European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing. What a word. So use your thing. Can you explain in a few words what, what this is really about from a technical perspective? What does it do? So PEPT was never supposed to be just a standard. It was supposed to be a collection of possible protocols uh, and architectures that would all have uh, three things in common. Good measurement um, of proximity, number one, a privacy preserving model, and number two, and number three, the ability to interoperate between different models and different implementations in different countries, because uh, I think number one is obvious. Uh, if, if you can do good measurement, then probably none of this is worth anything. Um, and part of your discussion yesterday was, is Bluetooth, Bluetooth accurate enough and, and so on? And I think we can go into this a bit. Uh, uh, number two is uh, if, if we want uh, to, to go for a privacy preserving model um, in a democracy, then that is an important part. And, the, the, and, and there are many ways to do this. Uh, and the, the, the third part is um, interoperability. I mean, we live in a globalized world and most of us enjoy traveling and enjoy all the goods that come from all over the world. Uh, so it's really important that infection chains also can be tracked uh, across borders, uh, but then uh, potential parts of infection chains in, in countries can be handled by the local authorities. So these are the three things that we set out to create a framework for possible implementations and um, make those available to the people who actually have to implement the apps and integrate them into the local health systems. So just from, from a development point of view, so how can I use uh, the code you're actually building at the moment? Currently there, there is, uh, for example, an Android uh, app has been published and some of the background code has been published. Security models have been published from uh, a German model, a French model, and and uh, you can, well, of course, you can read the papers and you can work on the pseudocode, but you can also use the implementation as far as it's it's there and build your own app on top of that. So the code is out, it's on GitHub, I, I suppose? Yeah. Uh, how large is the team working on uh, that kind of framework? So uh, there, there used to be all in all 200 people uh, on this. Um, now it's a bit smaller, um, uh, but there's still more than 100 people, um, actually 140 roughly, uh, uh, trying to figure out, and, and, and we've internationalized greatly. Um, since uh, I, I think a lot of the confusion that we had is that the teams also implementing the German app were, were um, very close to this, this implementation, and now we're much more focused on actually creating interoperability between standards. So that's how the team shifted. Okay, so uh, it's a European effort, as I uh, wrote in, in the news. Uh, how did you get that team together? How did you get to know each other? It was a real, like, exp this, is, this is also why this is not a, a real proper organization or anything. It was people getting together, having the discussion at a very early stage of uh, the pandemic, where, where case numbers were still very low, and, and we had the discussion on this will become exponential. We need to do something about it. We looked at the Chinese model, which was obviously successful, um, 
but I think would be totally detrimental to any Western democracy. Um, and this is why, why this whole question came up, can we do this differently? Because obviously the approach in China works, but do we really need this approach or can we do it in, in a way that better suits the way we live and think in Western democracies? So that's, that's okay. If that, that actually forces me for a follow-up question, no doubt. If you say that this is the Chinese version, that's the Western thinking, what's the difference? How do we differ? Well, I mean, in, in China, this, this is um, total surveillance, right? You, there, there is facial recognition, there is uh, location data, there is uh, a, a complete meltdown of privacy, um, which is a concept in, in China um, without pandemics. Uh, and it works for the Chinese society, it just probably will not work for a democratic society. Um, for example, you can't leave the house unless your uh, phone shows a QR code that says that you're in the, in the green. Um, and I'd say that most constitutions would not be very happy uh, if, if you would implement that, right? You basically a lock from the outside, you can't leave the house un uh, unless blah, blah, blah. Right? So mm -hmm. that, that I think would just not work. And also uh, using location data and anything that can go back to location that also very quickly allows to determine who you are, or where you spend the night, and all these type of things that that uh, I think need to be prevented. So let's think about us five here in the, in the room actually having that kind of app installed on our smartphones. How would that actually work? Well, I think you've discussed this in, uh, yesterday already, right? The, the whole point is that smartphones send out a beacon. They they uh, uh, don't need to connect. They just measure the intensity of, of uh, how they see each other's beacons, and depending on that intensity, they derive how close you are for how long, uh, and maybe at what activity level, and then they would determine according to an epidemiological model, um, is this a relevant event, meaning could you be uh, infected during this event, event? and if so, you're, you're stored as a contact, but all of this happens anonymously. Right? And then where, where models start to differ is what happens after you have been tested and confirmed positive. Um, and then something needs to happen. Right? In some way, you need to uh, uh, react to this. Like, should you be going to be tested? Should you be going to self-isolate? Should you be told to wear a mask or, or whatever else other measures there could be? One of the fascinating things when I was, was uh, looking closer at a solution and the problems actually to build a solution for the existing problem was, uh, was a few facts. So one fact is that the, the time from the infection and being infectious for other people is, is so long so that you can't even know if, if I might have a virus at the moment and could be infectious for you guys. I mean, so, this is the point, right? The, the point is that the whole question of how um, infectious diseases are treated, I mean, this is why every, every country has a, C, a CDC, um, a Center for Disease Control. Uh, is because there have been many effective infectious diseases before, like typhoid or uh, measles or anything that, that uh, could be a massive pandemic. Um, and the, most of those have been completely symptomatic. So while you're contagious, you also show symptoms. Um, and that, that way, it, it was possible to quell infection chains or contain an infection uh, by talking to the people with symptoms and for a very short time period, find out like, who did you meet? Like, did you meet more people in your family and so on? And all these processes that are there are very personal, right? They happen in, in the health authorities um, and, and uh, they ask you for the names and telephone numbers. And of course, in a democracy, like, the law says that you have to give those contacts. Um, but uh, as usual in democracy, you can choose yourself. Are you complying or are you not complying? And if you're not complying, you might be fine, um, but, but that is it, right? You're, you're not, your freedom, your freedom is not uh, obliterated just because um, you're not talking to anyone. And the other diseases could be um, found simply by looking for symptoms. For example, in the question of SARS, uh, you put up thermometers at the airport and, and that would be good enough. Um, and that way, um, you're actually able to um, uh, find potentially infected people, put them to the test, and uh, trace very short contact chains. Now, what you have, and, and that way you were able to contain the disease. Um, 
I mean, what we are, the period that we're in now is beyond containment, right? It was no longer possible to actually contain it, to follow up all the contact tra trails that were happening. And this is why most governments in the world have, have chosen to impose something dramatic like a lockdown um, or restrictions in where you can go, or closed shops and, and all these things. Um, because we went out of the zone where anyone was able to contain the disease anymore. And if we didn't want uh, the health systems to be completely overloaded and patients no longer getting treatment, then mitigation is what this phase is called is the only, is the only thing to, to be doing. So whatever we do in contact tracing is only makes only makes sense in that contagion uh, in this um, uh, uh, scenario where we can actually contain a, a disease. Um, and as you see, the numbers coming down of, of active cases, that also means that um, you think that you're back in the, in the area of where you can actually contain the disease. And the whole idea of contact tracing is because you have a lot of pre-symptomatic cases. Sometimes there's a lot of talk about asymptomatic cases, but those, those are not very much responsible, at least according to the data that we have now, those are not very much responsible for actually spreading the disease. Um, because it seems that even there, there might be a lot of asymptomatic cases around. Their viral load seems to be lower than in other cases, and meaning that they actually don't infect as many people as other ones. So the, the people and the symptomatic cases, you can just do what you've done before, right? The, the problem are the pre-symptomatic cases, so the people who are um, contagious before they show any symptoms. And these are the ones that uh, these contact tracing uh, um, apps or, or facilities look at um, because that means that you can get a, a look into the past and very quickly take potential infection chains out of uh, uh, the, the system where they can infect more people. So as, as you said, one of the problems is that the health departments really have to, to ask the questions like who did you meet for the last couple of days and uh, how long did you stay with those people? Let's, let's look at uh, what kind of parameters you use in, in the framework more closely. So uh, when, when would uh, an alert actually be triggered in, in terms of how long do you have to stay near to someone and in, in what distance so that this will cause the app to say, hey, you might have been infected? So in the original models, they used the basic flu assumption and which was a rule of thumb saying that um, if you have been closer to someone uh, for more than 15 minutes at a distance less than two meters, then you are at risk. Um, over time, these models become much more elaborate. They also take into account, uh, have, you, have you actually been with any uh, physical activity? So have you been breathing fast and, and stuff like this? Um, or have you been very still? Um, that, that also has an influence and you see the, the, the way that a potential risk is calculated is improving as scientists or epidemiologists get more information how the disease actually spreads. At the current moment, we do not collect data about the geographic uh, region of, of a person, right? It's just like, uh, do you have been in touch with someone in that kind of distance or not? That's the only measurement which is actually recorded. Am I wrong? There, or there right? are also models that, that take uh, an activity level into account, right? They say like, are you, are you physically active, yes or no, binary? Or they say like your activity level is between one and five. <laughs> Models like this exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So we, we had some, some good discussion, I think for the discussion which has been in, in, the, in the news recently as well, uh, for, for split between des uh, decentralized and centralized models. And as far as I understood from reading the news, you are not, not a proponent for either of that. Uh, you just are uh, saying uh, such a framework should be open for both opportunities. Was well, that right, quoted right, or do you have a different opinion? No, I'm totally, I'm, I, I've, I've uh, had a lot of criticism for that. Um, I think that both models are preserving privacy in the sense that um, we, uh, we define privacy today. Um, and if you just look at the crypto factors, if you just look at the cryptology, then of course a decentralized model is better, but a centralized model has its own, uh, own advantages. And I believe that as technologists, we can't really impose on people who take, who have the responsibility for a population and for an economy, 
um, we can make that choice for them because the question is not just the model, the, 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 the security architecture of this model. The question is really how do you manage the pandemic? And if they manage the pandemic in a way, for example, where they minimize risk and maximize people who are out, they probably need more data. And if they don't do that and they say like, no, we want uh, zero risk and quarantine everybody, then they don't need that data. And it's very, the, the, this app is not, a, the, this, this whole technology of uh, proximity tracing is not a silver bullet, right? It puts itself in uh, to a whole systems of measurements and, uh, and measures and decisions uh, and restrictions uh, that are made. And whoever creates that, um, whole construct, that fairly complex construct, also needs to be able to choose what they need. Just for, for understanding, does the PAPPT model allow both versions of architecture, or is it uh, uh, goes in one direction of it? Well, there, there is no PAPPT model, right? There are several models published um, at PAPPT, and there yes. uh, used to be um, decentralized and centralized models. Currently, there is um, uh, on, on the GitHub, there's only two, well, I wouldn't even call them centralized, right? Because they are, they are um, let's say, hybrid, partly decentralized, partly centralized uh, models. Um, but we still support the, the ability to interact or we we're working on how to make uh, interoperability possible between decentralized models that are out there um, as well, because I think they're valid choices. Yes. So uh, most most of um, the, the articles or uh, what has been discussed in the news recently was uh, the decentralized model. Uh, I would like to uh, look for a second on the centralized model, more from a perspective. What do we miss if we don't have centralized computing? Is I think this whole question, this whole model question, is totally blown out of proportion, right? And because. Um, Currently, if you look at the, the modeling that is done on how do you score risk, um, most of those algorithms that epidemiologists have come up with work with uh, data analysis and they work very straightforward. Uh, and that means that they're working on a, an available data pool. Could you implement these uh, models across a distributed data pool? Of course you can. I mean, this is algorithms. This is what computer scientists are, are here to do. Can you do it right now? No, not yet, right? This needs to be developed. Uh, and and uh, this is where, as I said, the, the whole time factor comes in, people who take responsibility need to make the decisions. And the, the whole point is that in a centralized model, you have data to compute on, in a decentralized model, you don't. Can you create an ability to compute? Probably not clear yet. Well, actually, no, most certainly you can create it, but it doesn't seem like it's available yet. So I, I follow on, on one of your thoughts and uh, statements before that uh, to say uh, at the current stage we should do the best to to um, fight the pandemic and to find the best model uh, to do that or best approach to I, do that. For example, a, a discussion that we should much rather have than w what crypto model to use is, um, is it correct that we make this voluntary? I yes. think if, if um, and from a democratic sense, I would say yes, because people are the sovereigns of a democratic country and then they need to decide, do they take part in society or don't they take part in society? On the other hand, there's probably also a good argument for making it mandatory because if you're, if you're not taking part, that means you're not just putting yourself in danger, you're also endangering others. Uh, and that of course, uh, you could make an argument, yeah, it should definitely be mandatory. Um, so I think these are the, the questions because they are much more touching the base of society um, and they're much more touching our personal freedoms. Um, those are the things that we should be talking about. I agree. Uh, one of the comments yesterday during the session was that one said, actually, when, when I'm infectious, I do not want to spread that news because I don't want anybody to know that uh, in fear of losing the job and being uh, in the quarantine. So this was actually one of the signals, which, uh, which uh, it's the first time I heard about that, that people uh, might have problems to uh, adapt uh, such an app and to say, I'm willing to work with such an app, which goes down to your question you're actually raising here. So what would make people uh, install it and uh, actually work with that kind of app? What's your opinion? 
personally, I think that there is two drivers and I believe in, in the good in people, right? So I'd say the one driver is that you want to be a good person and you don't want to hurt others. And then you should take part in this. Um, if you're, if, and, and I hope this, there will be enough people who are good people. And I think that in this type of crisis, you see it brings out the best and the worst. Um, but let's, let's approach it from the best part. I think a lot of people will do it just because they don't want to hurt others. Um, then on the other hand, you have other people, like if you look at the uh, pictures that we have seen from the US, which is certainly not a majority in the US, but, but uh, a crowd um, who, who proclaims something like my body, my choice. Right? This is not your body, your choice, because it's not like you are taking drugs and, and potentially killing yourself. It is you potentially killing others. And that, that's a discussion. Also, if you say my body, my choice, does that mean you're making consciously the choice that you do not want to be treated um, because you're causing the health system to be overloaded, right? Is that, these are the questions that, that are really uh, of, of social importance here. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, the pandemic at the moment and COVID-19 is uh, really the, the race of different discussions in the society I'm facing, which is not only related to the app, but to the whole lockdown itself. And it seems that there well, are part of the people who will fight for preserving freedom. So I don't want to be restricted. I don't want to, to have someone telling me what to do next. And other people were just, just saying, that's, that's fine, we need to do that because we need to uh, preserve our health system. We need to take care of our people who are in a, in a better, a worse situation from a physical standpoint, from a health standpoint. It seems that this kind of discussion is getting more intense uh, over time. At least it looks like that. Well, I mean, but that's an old discussion, right? Like how, uh, how important is personal freedom um, compared to the greater good, right? How much are you allowed to hurt the greater good just for your personal enjoyment? Uh, and that, that's an old philosophical discussion. And I think we should, uh, rather than talk to technologists, we should talk more to philosophers and, and uh, ethics researchers who, who have that in mind. And I think this is really important. And I would, what I am missing a lot from these discussions uh, is the word solidarity. Um, and I'm not talking about financial solidarity or euro bonds or anything like this. I'm talking about how much responsibility do you take for others? Um, and I mean, anyone who's, who's ever done the NASA test, I guess you know this, right? Uh, uh, will find out that a team of people of averagely smart people can achieve way more than a single very intelligent person can achieve. Um, meaning that solidarity is probably a very inbred or very um, evolutionary good principle that we have. Um, and in a, in a time that has been going rapidly towards um, egotism. Um, if you look at the, at the right wing movements that, that have been gaining traction uh, all over the place until the pandemic hit, um, that that is not a good approach and especially in the pandemic it's not a good approach because we need each other and um, that also means we take have to take responsibility for each other uh, one of the questions yesterday was also about how many people need to adapt uh, the, the app to make it uh, successful and uh, there are two numbers out there in the market the so one is the 30 percent one is the 60 percent stuff uh, what what does it really mean do you think it's 60 percent which is needed uh, the people using the app so it will work? So everybody's work is, is pointing towards the same uh, study, which was done by Christopher Fraser um, in Oxford. Um, all of those numbers come from there. Um, and um, the, what this study says is that if you want no other measures to be taken, then 60% of a population would have to, to adopt uh, the ability to find contacts on day zero. Um, that basically means that everybody with a smartphone has to adopt this in a, in a country like Germany. Um, every little helps, right? If you only have 1% or 2% or 10% adopted, that just means that your other measures that you're having will be more severe. If you have like 55% adopted, your other measures will be probably not very severe. Uh, and that's, that's the point. I mean, we self-regulate how much other limitations we want. And it really, it, it, is, it is kind of a, 
of a of a slanty curve. It looks like a a, a reverse logarithm, um, uh, and, and you end up in lots of restrictions, and you go to little restrictions in there. It is very much worth reading. I mean, if you're you're in the AI community, so I guess there are lots of people who enjoy math. Um, go to Freyer's site, read his papers. It really helps a lot in understanding um, how epidemiologists that actually model pandemics, not as just pandemic models, there is a lot of those around, but in the question of how can you manage a pandemic, um, it's really, it's a very good read. I believe so, yes. Um, so uh, looking at those numbers is probably, uh, it's just better to have people just using it. Looking at the, the framework and the app itself, how much interaction is necessary for me when, when I have it installed on my smartphone? Not much, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, this is also a lot of criticism that you get from the app because contrary to all other apps, like if you look at Uber or Airbnb, they all do something for you, right? This app does not do much for you. It actually does something for the others. Um, Potentially, it warns you, and then you've made the point that do I really want to be warned? Then I have to make the decisions: do I stay at home or not? And then, if I don't stay at home, do I just delete it so nothing happens? Right? The, these questions. Um, this is a counterpoint to normal app design because normal apps are built on what does it do for me. Um, in the end, you have to take two steps. Right? It does something for you because you directly protect others, meaning that you will have more freedom. So part of the usual product development process is thinking about how to communicate what you're doing. So since you are a loosely covered organization, it's not a company itself, how you decide about what to talk about for the framework? Well, the, the, you... if, uh, the, the manifesto of PEP is very clear um, and it holds these three points that I told you. Um, and because we are not really developing the apps, um, we don't have to, the, the sample apps that we put up only shows a very, very basic user flow. And the very basic user flow is, hey, you're installing the app. Are you sure you want to participate in this? Because it will mean blah, blah, blah. Um, and then once you're infected, it'll help you verify the, the test process. So, be, so you cannot mark yourself as being infected. It also needs a second confirmation. And once that is done, it says like, okay, now do you want to like partake in, in warning others? And it doesn't matter whether it's a centralized or decentralized model under it. This is always the same. Um, and, and that's the basic user flow, period. And then you can wait until the app tells you, um, hey, you've been in contact and you should be doing this, that, and the other. It's a very simple user flow, right? Of course, you can, if you look at models that have been implemented out there, um, they have added a lot of feature like a symptoms diary and because that's important maybe for you and maybe for your physician if you then go into treatment. Um, and also for researchers, I mean, there's a lot of questions of what symptoms have been um, uh, coming uh, and where. I mean, obviously, this is all very interesting for research, but it's a question whether you want to share this. By the way, for the Chinese patients, all of that is available on the internet on a patient by patient basis. Um, also, one question for me to clarify, if, uh, which seems to be a little bit misleading when, when I read the, the news currently, is. Um, um, since the government had the discussion as well, you know, um, the German government, uh, what kind of uh, architecture would be preferred? And we had the discussion with, again, centralized and decentralized. And we said we would like to focus on the decentralized one. Does that mean PEP-PT is out or is still in because you say we are open, it's a framework, and we have both sides implemented? Well, there, there's a misunderstanding, right? PEP-PT was never, PEP-PT itself was never implementing the German app that was yes. um, Fraunhofer doing it. And um, they, they were very much involved in, in PEP and in development of the app. And I think they've done a fabulous job actually in zero time, right? They've brought this almost to, to um, fruition. But as we've also said, it's the choice of a government um, which model it choose in the end. Yes, makes sense, makes perfect sense. Oh, I'm boring someone. One of, one of the five just dropped off. <laughs> Nothing bad. It's probably for time. It's near near midnight, right? Um, uh, Chris, uh, thanks thanks very much for all your thoughts and and uh, yeah, uh, the clarification you you bring. I will stop the recording for a second.